Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast, where we discuss films from every genre. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Welcome, listeners, to a brand new retrospective series we are kicking off today, which is Cloverfield. Oh, yes. Uh, Something that has kind of taken the American culture by storm as of recently. Yes. Cloverfield, the first movie came out in 2008 and it was pretty interesting how it was revealed but we're not going to talk about that just yet before we do that let me introduce myself to our new listeners this is your co-host corbin i'm alan from chicago and it's kind of interesting because the whole reason we started we wanted to do this retrospective series was because cloverfield 3 was supposed to come out in a couple months this is why we are starting it now, so it could be in time for Cloverfield 3's theatrical release date. But surprise, it is already out on Netflix right now, and right. we won't get into that. But anyways, we're still doing the retrospective, and we're going to still keep on track with the release dates for the episodes. But a little bit of a surprise. Yeah, just a little bit. Kind of, okay, it's kind of funny how we have planned for all these movies and they're going to come out, oh, they're going to come out on this date. So we'll do the retrospective up to here. That way we can get it on uh, release, on uh, theater, theatrical release. And then on two of them that we've scheduled have been rescheduled uh, by the companies. This one came out on Netflix <laughs> right after the Super Bowl happened, which was like months before it was supposed to be released, which is like, like what, April 20th, I think. Yeah. And so we had planned everything around that. And the next thing we know is released after the Super Bowl. And we're like, oh, what? And then, yeah, Avengers Affinity War was pushed up a week. Uh, that one isn't nearly as bad. But but um, it is interesting that movies that we have scheduled are just being pushed around all over the place. It's kind well, of and su- interesting. Su- <clears throat> surprise, we are getting Cloverfield for Overlord this October. What? <laughs> So we set out just thinking we were going to cover the theatrical release of the third one. Surprise, the fourth one was already done filming before we even knew really anything about the third one. Surprise, the third one is already out. And the fourth one is coming out just not very many months afterwards. And I believe that will be a Netflix release as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, we'll, we'll get to we'll get to Paradox in a few weeks, but that is interesting. Well, Cloverfield is kind of all about secrets. We don't really know oh. what's going on in yeah. the movie universe. Plus, this movie was also secretly greenlit, and the teaser trailer was released before Transformers. There's no title with the movie. And the second teaser trailer was released before Beowulf, and it did have a title. But this movie was really kept under wraps. It was a huge online viral marketing uh, there was an alternate reality game, MySpace pages, a slush show website, forums. Right. Um, very secretive, a very interesting movie. And they've been continuing to do that ever since and with surprises. And uh, I'd probably say this most recent movie is probably the biggest surprise of the three uh, oh, Cloverfield movies so far. Yeah. And it's kind of funny how, uh, I mean, it's not just the trailers either, but Every single movie of Cloverfield it has this running theme of just secrecy. Like in this one, of course, uh, we have the question of, well, how did the monster get there? And um, we will get to that part of eventually. But it's it's interesting that this theme of secrecy not only runs in just the marketing, which in this case is almost genius because it was shrouded in such, it was such on the down low of what exactly is this movie that everyone got interested and they started making up theories and that gained so much popularity. And it worked out um, for Cloverfield, not only in this movie, but also in future movies as well, just to keep that secrecy of what is this movie, you know, uh, all about. And it worked, um, not only for this one, but for, I would say, even the two sequels that came out, the secrecy and that uh, that withholding of information just makes people so interested to know, what is this? And surprisingly, the movie was released January 18th. Now, normally January releases are where the studio dumps their cruddy movies, but Cloverfield likes surprises and ditching the norm. And this was a huge January movie. Yeah, that is so interesting. 
the <laughs> fact that this movie was released in January, and I'm I'm pretty sure the box office is beyond great for that for it. Yes, and I did not see it in theaters. I am not a newbie to this series. I guess you could say I I believe this was my second time seeing Cloverfield, and I've seen the second one maybe. I know I've seen it at least twice. I think yeah. I might've seen it three times. And then the third one, I did actually go ahead and watch it the night it came out. So I've only seen it once, Yeah, but I'm not new to the series. So. I'm kind of on the same boat as you. I've seen the first one the most, actually. Um, I, I can't remember how I came across it. I think my cousin showed it to me. Um, and then I just kind of fell in love with it back in the day when it was first, when it first came out. I never saw it in theaters, um, but I did at one point own it on DVD before I had a Blu-ray player to collect it on. And then, of course, I sold it later when I didn't use DVDs anymore. I don't, I still don't own it at this point in Blu-ray. Uh, eventually, I might end up going to pick it up. But, uh, yeah, I've seen this one probably three or four times. I've seen the second one one and a half times. Um, and then, yes, I've also seen the third one. Uh, I didn't see it opening night, but I did eventually get around to watching it. Um, and that one I've only seen once. And then, I'll, of course, I'll see it again when we do the review in a few weeks. But yeah, the, I am also, we're both just not newbies to this series. Uh, but it, it is still, even coming back to it, it's still interesting picking up on little details that you just didn't notice before. I would have been 12 years old, actually, when this oh. movie came out. I was almost 13. It was, this is fairly close to my birthday. So I would have been almost 13. And you, Probably would have been around 11, right? Yeah, that, I Turning would have. Well, no, year. I would have just turned 12, actually, I think. Um, yeah, that makes sense. You would have just turned 12, actually, yeah. when this movie came out. So we were pretty young, and now I'm yeah. 23 years old, and the, <laughs> the the third one just came out. So it's been a number of years. This this is These sequels take a really long time. Yeah. This, this is a really spaced out franchise right it's kind of funny because it actually has been a decade from the original to now when we're doing this review um yeah. it's been a decade well i guess since the third one actually released it's been about a decade from the first to that one so it's, yeah well, you're right yeah, it's guess, been a long time i guess that was technically the quickest because the third the second one was it came out uh, i believe eight years after it came out in 2016 so eight years later we get a sequel yeah. and then about two years later, so it was a fairly quick turnaround for most sequels. The shortest a sequel can be is like a year, probably, which is normally weird. Um, sometimes it's like six months. I don't know, it's like The Matrix. Right. What, two and three, where it's like six months later you're getting it. But normally it's around like two to four years at the most. But anyways, let's jump on to a little bit of the details of this movie. This movie is actually directed by Matt Reeves. Yeah, I noticed that. That's... Quite interesting. I know that J.J. Abrams also has a big producing hand in this as well. You can kind of tell. Oh, yeah. So Matt Reeves is kind of a big deal now, I guess you could say. He's a pretty hot commodity for directing. He just finished up the Apes trilogy, which I know tons of people love. I own all the movies. I really enjoy the trilogy. Not the greatest trilogy of all time, though, like a lot of people are overhyping it to be. But very well done, especially the third one is is great. And he is uh, slated to direct a new Batman trilogy, actually. Oh, interesting. And we also have uh, Drew Goddard writing the script. And Drew Goddard, speaking of superheroes, actually created the hit uh, Marvel Daredevil TV show on Netflix right now. Oh, even more interesting. Well, he also wrote The Cabin in the Woods. Oh, okay. All right. World War Z, and he was actually Oscar nominated for the script, uh, The Martian. Oh, okay. So that's that's where I know him from because yeah, I've seen all three of these. I believe I believe that you just listed off. So yeah, he's no stranger to me. I've definitely been, uh, I've definitely seen a lot of his work. Well, the cast stars Mike Vogel, Michael Stahl, David, Jessica Lucas, Odette Annabelle, T.J. Miller, and Lizzie Kaplan. Yeah. Now these aren't really big A-list stars per se. I guess probably the most famous ones, Lizzie Kaplan was in Mean Girls and she was in uh, Robert Zemecki's film Allied in a small part. Uh, T.J. Miller, I guess back in the day was kind of famous. I don't know, but all these other people, I really don't know. I think Mike Vogel has done some stuff, but yeah. Right. 
right it's once again i guess i don't know well i don't know if this is just it being very secret or if that's just how it ended up being a bit more of a low budget film uh i think yeah like you said those two names especially um tj miller i'm not too sure of his popularity at this point he's gotten more popular since this movie at, at least i know that he's been in deadpool and the transformers movies of course so his he's gotten he's had more work since this movie it's not, at least from what i could tell but yeah, other than that, I'm not entirely sure who else is in this movie. I've never really seen them before or anywhere since. Well, the tagline for the movie is something has found us. Hmm. Interesting. It has a budget of $25 million, which is small, I guess, for today's standards, but not as small as you would think because most found footage movies have a budget, a shoestring budget of like five million or less right yeah they you're usually like especially when you get to like the levels of paranormal activity those go around to like the thousands of dollars because right. they are just as cheap as they could possibly make it and they make profit off of that this one is pretty surprising that it got 25 million from the studio i'm sure that jj abrams had a hand in that as well oh yeah absolutely and there is a lot of visual effects work in this movie. Oh, hence yeah. Hence the necess necessity of a larger budget. Right. And it did really well at the box office. It domestically grossed $80 million, foreign gross of 90 with a worldwide total of $170.7 million. So wildly successful. Yeah, definitely, especially for the budget that it got. It made quite a bit of money and i'm sure that this has kind of become more of a cultish movie as well uh once it released on home video yeah i i remember hearing people talked about this movie all the time oh cloverfield cloverfield oh, yeah. you see it it's scary and all this different stuff and it was big opening weekend it well it opened number one it uh, used to hold the record for the biggest martin luther king jr opening lap that four-day weekend it held yeah. the record but was beat out by Avatar and, oh. of course. Yeah, you can't beat that. <laughs> and American Sniper. And even it was beat out by that uh, silly Ice Cube Kevin Hart comedy ride along. Really? It was. It It is. It barely beat it out. Hmm, it, that's, so it's just right under it. That's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess it was a good time to release it because there was really no competition. The only competition uh, for that opening week was 27 Dresses. Yeah, I'd never heard of that. <laughs> it never came anywhere close to uh, the Cloverfield numbers. And number three was Bucket List, which had been out for a while. Juno is number four. National Treasure Book of Secrets had been out for a number of weeks. So there really wasn't any kind of competition, and this is kind of a big monster action movie. So it makes sense why this would do oh, yeah. so well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, pretty smart on the marketing end uh, to release it when really nothing else has been out, is out that the audience wouldn't have already ever wouldn't have already seen. So yeah, no wonder this made so much money. Oh yeah. And it's actually the fifth highest grossing found footage movie. That's quite surprising. Blair Witch is number one. That makes sense. Paranormal Activity number two. Also makes sense. Paranormal Activity three is number three. That, okay. That's weird. Paranormal Activity two is number four. And then, of course, Cloverfield. And then right below that is The Visit and Chronicle and project funny. x paranormal activity four and the devil inside so yeah, that's funny. those are the top 10 i've seen not, most not of those uh, i think except for the devil inside and actually i think it might be the only one i think i've seen the rest of them um we'll get into the quality a bit later of the found footage because there seems at this point in time found footage was huge um right. and it kind of got even bigger just a little bit for a couple more years and then now it's died out since then but when this movie came out found footage was pretty a pretty big deal well the audience from imdb gave it a seven that's which a pretty respectable score yeah that's that's good uh cinema score audiences that actually went verifiably went to go see the movie audiences did not like this movie actually really audiences gave cloverfield a c that does surprise me that's that's interesting. Why so low, I wonder? 
It's very interesting, but surprisingly, 77% of critics uh, said yes. This movie is fresh. It's got a 77% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't understand any of this. It's so all over the place. That's really funny. Usually, it's funny because this is so backwards. Uh, usually, it's the critics will hate a movie like this, and the audiences will just love the crap out of it. It's so backwards with this. That's really weird. Yeah, audiences really found it to be just extremely mediocre to just not good. Yeah. Very confusing. I don't know. I... Do you think that has kind of changed over time, though? Hence the IMDb score of a 7. Right. But regardless, uh, I, I found it pretty hard to get my hands on the teaser trailer. So I just watched, I think it was the regular minute and a half trailer or whatever. Pretty much the movie. Uh, yeah. I think there's a little bit of extra dialogue, but pretty much the movie. So, yeah. Yeah, it really does kind of capture the movie. It's, once again, very shrouded in secrecy. We don't see the monster at all, which is a very good thing, of course. Uh, yes. yep, like just everything you just said is basically the movie. I mean, it's just really condensed. I mean, I, really I think it's like pretty good. I how they kept the monster a secret. Yes, I'm very glad that they did that. Yeah, I remember that being really cool. I did when I watched it for the first time, it was slowly revealed to me. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got a good look at it, I was really impressed. And I, I, I think that's cool how they, but they didn't tease it so long where it's like you had to wait until like the very end of the movie. Yeah. Then you yeah. don't even, I hate it when you don't get to enjoy the monster in a movie. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. There's a really cool feature on the Blu-ray disc I want to mention to the listeners. If you have the Cloverfield Blu-ray, it comes with an investigation mode and it is literally supposed to be like the government found this footage and they have written up. Bi biographies of the people that you see on the footage there's a map on the left hand screen of manhattan and it shows you where the human subjects are where the primary military activity is and the large scale aggressor is which is the monster oh wow i did not it's, know that was on the blu-ray that's impressive it's really cool and i would say i would say ch check it out probably upon second viewing uh you want to immerse yourself the first time around but the second time, it's really helpful with lots of character bios and a bunch of story lore. I mean, it's really in-depth story lore and some real trivia and some trivia made up for the movie. And I, I definitely recommend checking out the investigation mode. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to go back and watch that because I didn't know. Then again, I didn't watch it on my copy of the Blu-ray as my cousin. So I just kind of popped it in. And then when I was done, I put it back. So that's that's so interesting. That makes it even... Yeah, that, like you said, it kind of makes the story even more engaging to kind of explore what exactly has been going on and, and stuff like that. Yeah. The Blu-ray does come with some very insightful special features. I really recommend watching it. You could skip the deleted scenes and alternate endings because they're just kind of a waste of time. Yeah. Honestly. Uh, but J.J. Abrams in an interview said he wanted the U.S. to have a notable Godzilla-esque monster like the Japanese do. He recalled going to Japan with his son, and there was Godzilla items in shops everywhere, and Godzilla has stuck around for, I don't even know how long it's been, oh, gosh. Like 60 or 70 years yeah, or something. Yeah, decades. So Abram's hope was he could create a monster that would reach the levels of pop popularity, everlasting popularity as Godzilla. I don't think that's been achieved yet. Right now, granted, Godzilla. There's like twenty Godzilla movies. Yeah, it's... and there's no end in sight. So maybe right. that's how it's going to be with Cloverfield. Is we're going to be doing this retrospective until Cloverfield twenty? Right. I don't know what we have right. what we have started. I don't know exactly. And it, it kind of needs to go to say that those movies have been been going on, and not only been going on, but have been out for years and that's why it's kind of engraved itself into the culture the japanese culture and and stuff like that it's kind of like um our superhero movies i guess you can kind of say um they have kind of just engraved themselves and now they're becoming more of a medium uh more of a movie making medium now but yeah it's something that i think is a very good possibility but it's only been 10 years since the first one came out. So we still have a long time to see if that's going to achieve the levels of Godzilla in the Japanese culture, just as it would here in America. 
Um, right now, I think it's a bit too young to say just yet if it has done that. Uh, marketing aside, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Yes, and the, the creature designer said he did say this creature is an infant, hence the size of... The, it's still huge. Oh, yeah. But it's still technically an infant, and Matt Reeves also said the creature is actually not malicious. Matt Reeves said when he was making the movie, he saw the creature as confused and bewildered in a new environment. So it's really not here to be this... I guess Godzilla has always been mostly the bad guy, uh, unless yeah. in the new American reboot, he really wasn't. But this monster is just a new baby kind of looking for its mother, I guess you could say. That's what I learned from the special features and um, what they were able to do with the visual effects, I think, for the time was really incredible. So I definitely recommend check get, picking up the Blu-ray because there's a lot to explore with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I did notice that there are some shots on the Blu-ray that I was... I mean, to, to be fair, it is found footage. Um, but there are a couple of shots, like, when we're just walking down the street or when we're running onto the sidewalk. I was like, that looks really impressive in Blu-ray, um, especially with the CGI in the background. Um, uh, we'll get into how dated it is. But yes, for the time, it was quite good, which is even surprising because now, I mean, it's... For, for, we'll get into it, I guess, a bit later. But yeah, I I agree with you. It's I definitely say own this on watch it on Blu-ray. It it looks so good on Blu-ray. Oh yeah, it looks so much like a found footage movie, and we'll get to that in a minute. Well, we're about to spoil the movie, so if you have not seen Cloverfield and you do want to see it without knowing any uh, secrets of the movie, then I prompt you to pause the podcast right now. Don't worry, we'll still be here when you come back. Go ahead and watch the movie and come back and hit play once you've watched it and it'll pick right back up where you left off. But you've been warned we're about to spoil the movie. So, Rob has taken the job of vice president at Slush Show, causing him to move from New York to Japan, which prompts his brother and soon-to-be sister-in-law to throw a going-away party for him. HUD, Rob's best friend, is asked to record interviews of Rob's friends saying nice farewells for him to watch later on tape while he's in Japan. At the party, we are introduced to Rob's brother Jason, his girlfriend Lily, Hud's crush Marlena, and Rob's three-week-old flame Beth. Hud, without realizing it, is taping over footage of Rob and Beth waking up in bed together three weeks ago and going to Coney Island. But Rob started ignoring Beth right after their intimate night together because he felt that was the best way to break things off before leaving for Japan. Alas, Beth shows up at the party, causing Rob to question everything. While out on the emergency fire escape talking with his friends, a massive earthquake rocks New York, which causes a large-scale power surge. The group runs to the roof to see if they can find out if a terror attack has occurred when an explosion erupts in the heart of the city, causing a destructive firestorm. Once in the street, the group of friends, minus Beth, must run for their lives as they slowly begin to realize a giant monster has unleashed itself upon New York City. One by one, the friends die tragic deaths as they try to escape, but Rob has his mind on saving Beth. With only three members left, they make it to Beth's leaning tower of Pisa high-rise apartment, save her, and escape in a helicopter. That is, until the monster crashes their copter. They, lay, they crash land in Central Park where the monster rips HUD apart and Rob and Beth escape under a bridge where they say their last goodbyes as they are bombed seemingly to death. Reverting to the old footage that was being taped over, Rob and Beth film their time at the Coney Island Ferris wheel, but the camera catches a small object crashing into the ocean in the distance as credits roll. So this is interesting. The whole movie basically the whole movie is all about these about these people just caught in the middle of this situation and they want to get out and we basically just get to see them run around new york city and try and escape multiple times um while this monster just keeps coming around and all sorts of stuff it it makes for a very thrilling experience especially one that i would have loved to see in the theater um if i ever had the chance to so interesting that I mean, it is still a monster movie after all, but yeah. I would agree. It is a very uh, immersive first-person experience. 
And especially once you start getting into the streets, the scope of the movie, I would say, is very well done. Oh, yeah. Uh, there are many times where it's quite intense and you feel the intensity and you feel like you're right there yeah. with it. So I really do like that. And it's interesting because this movie opens up with some government numbers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it basically says this footage was recovered by the government in Central Park. And the case that this footage they called is designated Cloverfield. Right. Now, there is one thing in the footage that I did notice. Uh, Central Park, the code for it is US-447. Uh, it says, yeah, uh, formerly area, for, area formerly known as Central Park. Did a little Google search. It means nothing. It's just a made-up code oh. for the movie. It, the only thing it references oh. is Cloverfield itself. Um, just in That's case funny. anyone was curious, it's not some secret government code for actual Central Park. It's just made up for the movie. Uh, I mean, duh, of course. But yeah, one thing I also found very interesting is the first thing we see really uh, after the, the Paramount logo um, is this watermark of property of the U.S. government do not duplicate. I just found that kind of funny. It is funny. Well, okay, I got to give a little bit of a warning to the people who have not seen this movie. I got to say, you might want to watch it on a little bit of a smaller screen because the shakiness of the camera sometimes is fairly extreme. Yes, it can be. I mean, a lot of found footage movies are kind of like that, but this one is especially can has moments where it's really shaky. This was one of the most shaky found footage I have seen, and I know we were watching it for the first time in my theater room, which is about a 140-inch screen, and we ha I was watching it with my dad, and we had to shut it off a couple minutes in because my dad was getting motion sickness from this, and watching it on this big of a screen, I don't know. It was a little too much. I opted to watch it on the 55-inch, and I was quite a ways back from the screen, I found it to be fine, although at times I did find the shakiness of the camera to be a little unpalatable for my tastes. Right. And I, I do kind of want to mention that uh, I do think that the found footage element really works in this movie. Um, if we didn't have that found footage element, I feel like a lot of this movie's intensity would have been lost because, it, like you said, it is meant to be first person uh, this is th HUD and his crew. This is their perspective on this giant monster attacking Manhattan. Uh, without this found footage element, I feel like a lot of the intensity would just would be gone. Um, of course, the shakiness aside, um, I think that this is one of the one of the elements of the movie that makes it so I'd say intense and maybe even as popular as it is. Um, just by this alone is just quite. It makes the movie almost original, which we'll get into in a minute if it is or isn't. But yeah, it, it's this is one of the things that I actually really enjoy. Um, now, whether or not he should have been recording everything that he does is also something we'll get to eventually as well. Yeah, J.J. Abrams actually said he wanted to make a horror monster movie that the audience could experience like this level of fear in a safe way. Yeah. And I was like, that's actually a really cool idea. And I would say that's that's definitely accomplished in here because I put in my notes like the terror in this movie is so well done. Mm -hmm. You are really feeling like you're in the situation with them. And I think the uh, directors and producers really accomplished that. And you can you can experience what it would be like, honestly, to be in this situation. But from the safety of your. Right. So. Exactly, exactly. That's nice. And one other thing I want to mention is um, I can't remember what camera this is actually filmed on, but at times it feels like an authentic camera, not just like one that they use for movie making, like a Red mm -hmm. Epic or whatever. Oh, really? The yeah, opening yeah. shot of this movie um, is Rob walking down the hallway into, I think, the living room space. No, it was the bedroom space of the of his dad's apartment or penthouse. Right. Um in the opening shot, you see kind of some grainy elements because it's kind of in a low light. Um, it isn't exactly the brightest in the area that he's in. It really goes – this happens a couple of times too. When in darker elements, it's quite grainy. 
it really helps kind of give that authenticity of okay, this is it feels like it's filmed on just a consumer camera. Like someone just yeah. picked one up and just began filming. And that even though it may not look the greatest, it really adds to that element of realism, I would say. I definitely agree with that. And actually at times some of the cast were actually filming this themselves. Now sometimes right. for more of the major scenes, there was you know, camera operators, professional ones, but it, in behind the scenes footage, um, TJ Miller actually did a lot of this filming himself, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And I feel like that once again, just kind of adds on to the realism that they're letting the cast make this movie, not just them acting, that they're also filming it too, which is even more interesting. Now I got to say in the beginning of the movie, I was fairly confused about which character was who and who were they with. Um, for some reason, I put the main character is Matt. Nope, not his name. I thought that's what that's what I thought that's what it said. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, so the movie takes place April twenty seventh. Nope, it jumps ahead about a month. And then I was really confused because I thought, uh, gosh, I don't even remember her name now. I think it's Lily. Okay, I'm gonna say Lily, Jason's girlfriend. Yes, yes, that is right. Lily is his girlfriend. Uh, Okay, so I thought because we have Rob filming in the beginning, then I thought him and Beth were walking down the street, and then it's Lily, and I was like, oh, he got a new girlfriend, and then it shows him, and I was like, oh, okay, so he's got a new girlfriend. Right, yep. (laughs) And then I said, okay, maybe the main character's name is Jason, and then then we finally figure out about rob i think i said wait so is jason with this black lady now and not the girl from the beginning two question marks and then i said why do jason and rob look like twins i i said now i don't know who we saw in the beginning i hate everyone's hair in this by the way (laughs) yeah um the the opening to this movie does get kind of confusing with the characters they are explained a bit later um, but yeah, in the first, like, say, maybe five or six minutes, it get, becomes incredibly confusing because Jason and Rob look very similar. And uh, when it switches to them to when it switch, when it switches from Rob in the in the apartment to Jason walking down the street, I, even I was confused when I every time I've watched this and this opening where I was like, OK, now, wait, where are we now? The timestamp is really what it gives it away. Um, because in the opening it's in April, but then when it cuts to Jason on the street, it's in May. So that's one thing to kind of give a hint. And it does explain later on that, oh, we're making a party for your brother, Rob, and I need you to film, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's explained later, but this opening is, yeah, I agree. Quite confusing. I had, even I was getting confused with names and I had to write down people and I kept thinking that, uh, HUD, no, I kept thinking that Rob and Jason were were switched. I didn't know who was going to Japan or who was dating who, and it just got confusing. I eventually figured it out, but yeah, this opening, a little bit confusing. If you use the investigation mode, it will give you everything. You won't be confused at all. But oh, yeah, I could if imagine. you didn't like I didn't, then I was fairly lost. But honestly, this party scene is I don't know. It's like the first 20 plus minutes of the movie. Yeah. It's a little too long because I know it's kind of like they're supposed to lull us into this party sense. And it doesn't look like, honestly, I would not want to be at that party. And I Looks can't packed. believe he has that many friends. I have like seven friends that I would invite to a party like right. that I know that well. And he's got like 50 people there. It's right. crazy. It, I agree. It's... This party scene, yeah, it is pretty long. And, I I mean, it's fine at first because we're being introduced to all the characters that we're going to be living with for the next hour and a half or so. Uh, We're getting introduced to all the personalities, and and HUD is now taking over the camera. Poor guy. Um, And all this kind of stuff. So, at first, it was pretty helpful to kind of, for me, to lock down these names and say, okay, this is this character. Rob is leaving for Japan. Jason is his brother. You know, that kind of stuff. But then it just keeps going and going, and then it's like, okay, can we just move on with stuff? And although uh, one thing I did end up liking um, was how quick it jumps into the action and how jarring it is. Because you have no idea it's coming until it's already happened, and then it's basically a shock. And it kind of just – it's almost an adrenaline rush from here to the end of the movie when they're talking into like – I think it's like the boiler room or something – 
and then of course the earthquake happens and the power goes out. That was still was very shocking, albeit it takes a while to get to that point. Yes, I kind of was forgetting about the whole attack and monster stuff. I thought this was because I, I was beginning to question where we were going with this movie. Yeah, because I'm like, oh, is this like a found footage rom com? I I forgot about the government stuff at the beginning, and I just I didn't understand the direction of the movie. There's some funny lines and some funny parts, but overall, it just kind of gets a little old. Uh, but yeah. that like earthquake was really surprising. That was pretty. Yeah. That really does jar you, and then you're in, and especially when they go to the roof with that explosion. And honestly, oh, yeah. I was thinking um, terror attack in my head, especially with New York already, and I'm sure that's what they're. And we get two characters in the background say, what do you think? Another terror attack? And right after that, someone says, it's a terror attack. And it's it's yeah. really good and oh, really yeah. intense. Yeah, absolutely. There is This movie does not shy away um, from terrorist attacks being a main theme. Uh, it's been about, I think, seven years or so since 9-11. And we get a lot of 9-11 imagery here in a little bit when the Empire State Building collapses and the Lady mm-hmm. Liberty head is just flying through the air and lands on the street. We get a lot of that kind of imagery, a lot of points in this movie, and it's very clear that that's what this movie is going for. I mean, it's been a few years since 9-11, and this mm-hmm. movie is still, I guess, trying to hearken on that horror still as well from that event. Maybe not not necessarily from that alone, but images like that. And this movie does not shy away from that either. It's is very much very clear in my mind that that's one of the things that is used one of the themes that it's using to build its story and all that kind of stuff and i do find it to be very effective especially in that opening scene when the empire state building collapses and that giant dust cloud flies across the city it is really really engaging one of the questions that i had in this movie is a lot of the characters start talking about their cell phones don't work and for some reason there's a huge power surge yeah. And that is not explained in the movie, I feel. Now, maybe in the investigation mode, it gives a reason. Maybe in the, I don't know, in the third movie, that we're not going to get into that. But maybe that's the reason why the cell phones don't work. But it doesn't make any sense. I was like, just, that really didn't make any sense. Why would the phones not work? Right. My only thing that I can really kind of give for an excuse is they were not nearly as reliable as they are now. Uh, smartphones were do it did exist at this point but they were not near the popularity that they are now where basically now everyone has one but back then mm-mm. um you were still rocking the flip phone uh even for me if you were lucky you had a flip phone when i was at that age um but i yeah, that is not really explained the only reason i can probably give is that it just the service wasn't nearly as reliable, and when the power went out, it takes a while for all those towers to turn back on and connect with one another. I don't know. I can't exactly answer that. That's the only excuse I can give. It kind of, for me, it was very, not. it wasn't too big of a deal, but it is a question that comes up a bit later as well when uh, they do begin to work and Beth calls Rob and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, let's get into the <laughs> the thing between Rob and Beth real quick. Um, okay. This is weird. Yeah, it is really kind of stupid, I think. I hate it in movies where there's two characters together, and then one of them acts really stupid. They're like, oh, you just quit talking to her. And he's like, I thought that was the best thing to do, but I can't stop thinking about her, and I hope she's here. And it's just like, really? It's just so stupid and immature, and I hate it when they're like, oh, yeah, we were just together like three weeks ago, and now I have a new boyfriend, and... Yeah, I don't know. It's it's fairly dumb. And so most mostly the point of this movie is not to escape, but it's to find and save Beth. Yeah. The damsel in distress. Especially that second half. That's kind of becomes the main focus. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, I think the Beth and Rob subplot probably could have been cut out. To be fair, it also does add some interesting dynamics later on when they do have to climb up that building and... They had to climb up the one that's standing up right to get across to Beth's, which is leaning on top of it. That's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, other than that, did we really need this? That conflict between Rob and Beth? Because it just, 
at the party, it feels really awkward, and it's kind of meant to be that way. But it almost feels like we're just wasting time because that after once we get once Beth shows up at the, at the party, it just becomes almost a melodrama, and and we just Rob Hud is going everywhere and we're filming everything, and I begin to question why is he filming this. Um, we also, I also begins to question why is this even in here because, uh, Beth and Rob are having their drama and, and how he ran off on her and all this stuff. And why did she even show up in the first place is beyond me. So I, I, think I this, totally agree. This element. Yeah. I think this element could have been cut the, not Beth's character, but the relationship drama between her and Rob, I think that probably could have been taken out. And it really wouldn't have changed too much. There is, I guess, a character arc for both of them in the very end. But whatever, I guess. I don't know. It's not too important, not too integral for the story, except for maybe characters. Well, yeah, know. it's trying to kind of give us this drama that's really weird because she brings her new boyfriend, Travis. Yeah. Why? And I was like, why did you even show up? She still has feelings for him. But yeah, it becomes this mostly, he's like, I got to go save Beth. And he's like, well, she's all the way in Midtown. We're never going to make it. And honestly, don't even go there because that's mostly what the party scene is all about. Yeah. There's just like a couple moments of friends, but then it's mostly just uh, Rob and Beth drama. So if I don't know, but this movie is already really short. So they had to figure out a way, I guess, to make it a theatrical runtime but yeah honestly just cut it out and just put them together i would have much much rather preferred them to probably already be together and trying to escape because i thought at the very end it was fairly touching when they were running for their lives and like saying their goodbyes and that they love each other i was like yeah "Yeah, i wish we would have kind of had more of that throughout the movie and not just i don't know i i agree and the other thing i want to say is kind of like what you've already brought up before some of it makes sense to film but then otherwise it's like at a certain point i probably would have stopped filming yeah <laughs> that's exactly what i was thinking when i was like halfway through the movie i was just like okay would i would i have kept filming all of this if i were in the situation and even if he would have kept the camera running he the way that it's shot is most of the time he has it all the way up to his head because he's looking eye level at all of the characters, which means I'm like, so you're just running through the street, like with the camera up to your eyeball right. this whole time. It's fairly unbelievable. And I don't know how long that kind of tape would last in 2008, but this runs for, I don't know how long it goes for like seven hours. It's, I mean, I understand like there's, I guess there was times when he stopped filming. Right. I don't know, or the or maybe this this is footage where the government has siphoned it down for us. Right. I don't know. I mean, I know in the investigation mode, it said that their walk through the tunnel, it said parts of parts of the footage were cut out, but overall, it took about an hour to an hour and five minutes to walk through that tunnel. Yeah. So yeah. Now back in two thousand eight, and really, I mean, years before that, they. The tapes would be about, it could be anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. What I am worried about is the battery life on that camera because there ain't no way that camera lasted them seven hours. Uh, there ain't no way. I mean, I would be surprised if any camera of that kind of a quality lasted for seven hours. Um, so my only guess is the tapes were just an hour and a half long that they had. Um is so that's what they were recording over. Now, why Rob used a huh? why Rob used all the not all those ninety minutes on the tape with him and Beth is not also beyond me. But yeah, yeah, it's I don't know. I know I don't know anybody that just films things for that long, right? Uh, right. Uh, I don't know. It's... I'm also a little bit confused because in the opening it mentions that. This is on an SD card, yes. but everywhere in the film, it's talked about this being on a tape. So I'm guessing this was recorded to a tape. And if that's the case, how did they get this high of quality of footage? But that's beyond me. Usually, they'll just put that on an SD card because I could store that high. You can store HD footage. A tape, not necessarily. Um, that's a little bit something that a little bit confused me. That's kind of a nitpick at that well, point, though. 
But in a way, it's not a nitpick, though, because throughout the movie, there are times where HUD will stop the camera and then it'll cut back to the other thing. And Rob says, are you taping over that? Well, I don't really think that's how an SD card works. Oh, no. Where you tape over a file and the file still retains itself when the footage is or when the filming is stopped, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. And there are times where HUD will stop the camera. It'll show Rob and Beth a month ago. And then there are times where there will be cuts in the footage. Right. And I'm like, wait, show, did you stop it? Or is this the government cutting it out? There are some significant issues, I would say, with believability and with just playing by the movie's own rules that it Mm -hmm. has established. It kind of cheats a number of times with that. So I think that can, for, it is an immersive experience, but then it also can't really take you out of the movie when you're just like, wait a minute. Nobody's filming this right now. The camera's broken, you know, right. whatever. Yep, I agree. Uh, yeah, so with an SD card, when you record something, that piece that you recorded is recorded on a single file. It would not overwrite anything else in the card unless the camera was set up that way. But even that doesn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, only would this happen if it's on a tape. So I'm just guessing that this is my guess. And this is kind of what I'm I'm assuming is correct. The footage that we see was recorded on a tape, but was then put later onto an SD card for the government. That's the only thing I can really think that happened. Uh, if that really is the case, I'm not entirely sure. But mm-hmm. yeah, you're totally right. Some believability here between this is kind of muddled. Um, it doesn't exactly explain everything. So I'm just guessing this is all on a tape. High quality for a consumer tape, but you know, what are you going to do? It's that's once again, and I think we're at that point, we're kind of dipping our toes into nitpicks, but still, mm-hmm. I think you are still right. It does kind of raise a good criticism of believability here. I got to say some of the lines in this movie are kind of cheesy, but yeah. I will say the characters are fairly well done. Yeah. Probably the best is Rob. He seems uh, like the emotions he gives sometimes are pretty good. They're fairly believable. So I, I was surprised by that. But some of these lines are really on the nose. Uh, Marlena says something. I'm trying to find it. This was when she, uh, HUD was filming her at the party. She says, we're going to keep New York safe and fun for you until you come back. Okay. And then a tragic accident happens right after that. So yeah. Fairly on the nose, and they're like, what is it? I don't know, but whatever it is, it's winning. You know, just yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, in my own opinion, yes, you're right. I think that Rob is the most fleshed out character of mm-hmm. this movie. We get to see him do a lot of dynamic emotions. You know, he's really, really happy when he first enters the party. He becomes really, really super depressed when his brother dies. He has to tell his mom. He gets the most uh, development, I would say, of all the characters here. But I would say my favorite is actually Marlena. Uh, she's just so sarcastic and always witty, even when she gets bit by, I think it's the baby, one of the babies coming off of the monster. She is still throwing lines that are just funny. Um, she's always just the most enjoyable for me whenever I watch this movie. But yes, Rob, I do believe, is the most fleshed out in this little group. HUD, I'm going to say right now, I do not like the character of HUD. I think he really is annoying at a lot of points in this movie, and it kind of becomes a bit of a downgrade for me in terms of score when this happens. And I got to say, HUD gives a line later on in the movie where Beth says, what is that? And it's the monster running towards them, and HUD said, it's a terrible thing. And yeah. I was like, that that seems like a HUD line, but at the same time, it doesn't seem plausible. And then once again... When they kill the creature in the hallway, he's like, it's another terrible thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's just really cheesy and uh, not not the best yeah. of writing for him. And I clearly HUD is stupid. Like when we first see him, he's got his mouth hanging open, you know, his lips are all wet. And he's like, I don't know what to do. Right. And he's like, how you doing? Hey, you know, yeah, I'm just a really dumb character. Honestly, I don't believe him and Rob would be best friends. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering. I off I I kind of wonder if this was a a bet that J.J. Abrams lost to T.J. Miller, where he's just like, if I do this, then I get to be in your movie, and then he <laughs> lost, and now he's in this movie. Because I feel like there's really no place for Hub, Hud to be here any at any point. 
He's chalked yeah. up to be Rob's best friend, and you're right. It makes no sense why he's his best friend because he's um, he's meant to be an idiot, you know. Yeah. It, it just doesn't make much sense for his character to be here, and he has really stupid dialogue. I don't know. It doesn't – his character, I feel like, is the least likable of the group here. He's just kind of always out there and says random things at random times that are almost – which at times is inappropriate um, for him to be saying that it, it's, I don't know, it's, he could have been written so much better and yeah. him. And there are also a couple of, li- couple of lines of dialogue that are just not just from him, but from the cast in general presented, not the greatest line um, that could have been done much better. It, there are a lot of one liners that are just kind of like, it's kind of cheesy. It's kind of a thing with this movie. It's for the most part, not, something that I would get mad at per se, but it is something that I do take off the score is the right. dialogue isn't the greatest. And what you were saying about Marlene's character, I do like that she's kind of like this somewhat selfish party girl that really, yeah. she's like, I really don't even know Rob. I was just here to see somebody else, a friend of a friend. And so she doesn't really belong with this group but they still take her in and she is pretty much like catatonic for a while but then she does actually uh help hud and sacrifices herself and yeah. it does end up killing her for it and that bite she gets is really gross and I'll, okay i really gotta say when the military starts shooting at it in the streets awesome intense scene just the fire it gets so loud and then in the tunnel yeah. i found that to be a pretty scary scene Oh, yeah, I totally agree. That scene when they are just walking down the street and then all of a sudden the monster just shows up out of nowhere and the military runs in and they're both on HUD's on one side and everybody else is on the other side and the HUD military just running right through and the tank kind of just rolls by. Crazy scene. And there's a really great shot of, um, at this point, with Rob and crew, they dart from one side of the street and they go for the subway tunnel on the other side in front of HUD. And so HUD is running after him and you see this shot of them just running across the street and there's like the monsters in the background, the military's behind them that they're running towards. A really cool shot and they run around the corner and into the subway. Yeah, you're right. This is a really pretty thrilling scene uh, just to kind of show the panic and everything that's happening. It really, really kind of sets in the... Um, the big scale of the movie and how it is affecting the characters. I, I do agree. This is a pretty great, a really fun, intense scene. Mm-hmm. And I do got to say, I really like how this movie is supposed to be a fairly continuous real time yes. adventure where we are beginning at this point and it's supposed to take over the span of many hours. Uh, right. I, that's pretty unique. I don't really know of too many other movies like that. Especially before this. I know from then on we have Hardcore Henry. You saw that movie. Mm -hmm. Where it's all first person fighting for like the whole thing. But that's a little different from what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it is a bit different. Hardcore Henry is all filmed on, I believe, GoPros. All first person stuff. They, um, it is a lot of fun. A lot of, very much an adrenaline rush. Just like this one kind of is. Uh, This one is a bit more, uh, I think... Hardcore Henry is a bit more streamlined. This one is. This one has multiple characters that we can follow, whereas Hardcore Henry is basically just basically just one guy. So there's a bit of difference, but yes, they are pretty similar. Now that you bring it up, uh, Hardcore Henry is more of an action movie than this is more of a horror survival monster movie. I do like that they kept this PG-13. A lot of times yeah. we will see, uh, just when the creatures are attacking them, it's really scary. It's right in your face. We do get like we see your get bit we see a spike through beth's chest but when they put the camera down we don't get to see it happening we just get to hear the gruesome yells and i definitely think that makes it a lot more scarier and incoherent because we are just really bewildered trying to figure out what's going on and yeah it really just kind of leaves that horror up to the imagination to right because you we're just like we feel so helpless because we don't really always see fully what's going on in those situations i think that was yeah, the right I, choice i agree and it kind of feels like they weren't exactly it kind of feels like they weren't exactly worried about the rating of this movie because this does get pretty graphic for a pg-13 movie like when marlena says oh i don't feel so good they make it they make it to the um yep. medical area 
with all of the military people and she's Marley comes up out of nowhere and she's like, I don't feel so good, bleeding from the eye, and then a doctor comes by and says, We have a bite, they pour behind the tarp and she just explodes. Um, like that is just shocking. And it's quite yeah, like quite disturbing. Same with uh Beth having the, the metal pole through her chest mm-hmm. or a couple of other moments. It feels like they weren't really worried too much about the rating, but just so happened that they got a PG thirteen. I think that that really sets in the tone of this movie that, yeah, like you said, it's almost hopeless because of all these terrible things that just keep happening over and over and over again. Um, right. Now, if, if this were rated R, uh, I think it may even take away from some of the believability. The only critique I really have is that Beth's, when they pull Beth off of the metal pole, I, in my own opinion, I think that they should have shown that because they've really shown everything else up until that point. But like you said, it is kind of left up to the imagination of uh, what exactly happened and all that kind of stuff. I do think that this is pretty effective and surprising for a PG-13 movie. Usually they seem to be quite watered down, but this one is not really that way. And once they get to the medical area, we get our first real, I don't know, MacGuffin-esque plot. I kind of hate to use those words, but... The soldier says you have until 6 a.m. because they're going to use the hammer down protocol. Mm -hmm. So you have to go save Beth by this point and get out of the city, get to the helicopter at this point. It's very, you know, a paint by numbers, ABC type of plot where the characters clearly have to go here and meet this objective and then go here and meet this objective in there. And I do like the... I won't, we won't get there yet, but I do like the wrench thrown in it when, when you think all is well and they are escaping and they're like stealth bombing the thing from super high up and then it, it trashes the helicopter. That was, that was cool. But anyways, what I wanted to talk about was, okay, here's what I wanted to mention. I will say the transitional scenes where they are getting from A to B are kind of boring. Give me an example of okay. what you mean by that. Um, a lot of, okay, it's pretty much, I put this in my notes after they left um, the medical area and they were getting to Beth's place. Okay, when they were walking through the hallways and this and that, I feel like that could have been sped up a little bit. There are times where they're just running through the streets and I understand some of that is necessary, but then when it just shows them forever trying to get to Beth, through that apartment. Right. I don't know. There were just times where I put it on 1.5 X to just kind of get to those areas a little quicker because it's like, okay, let's, let's go. Come on. You know, I don't want right. to just sit here and watch you walk down the hallways or run upstairs forever. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I, I do kind of agree with you on that. The first moment that I actually kind of felt that these, the slow moment really could have been cut down is when they first enter the subway tunnel yes. um, before they make their way to the next station. Uh, this of course is a very important moment because we get to see Rob tell his mom that, yeah, my brother died when the monster's tail hit the Brooklyn bridge. Cool moment, by the way. Um, so we kind of see that, but it kind of drags for a while. And then I begin to wonder like, why is HUD filming all of this? Yeah. So that's one big moment where I'm just, where I, I do very much agree with you. Once again, we're walking up the stairs. Why do we need this in the movie? That could have been cut out completely. If I were in this situation, I wouldn't film all of this. Ain't no way. So that's, I do agree with you there. Um, now, I do think that this though moment in the subway is important and does need to be there. But I put in my notes, this should have been put later on in the movie, not so close to the beginning of all this terror it should have been put later when we you know when we've already gotten to know these characters and and stuff like that and we have to see them kind of kind of wallow in their sorrow now because of oh, what's yeah. happened before and all that kind of stuff maybe after marlena died they could have had this moment before they actually began uh to go after beth and that's when they get the line that the chopper's taking off at 6 a.m from central park you know all that kind of stuff um so I think that that moment in the subway could have been moved around in the timeline of the movie. Yeah, that's um, a great point, actually. Yeah, Be- and yeah, that, I- yeah. Like you said, the stair up, up the stairs walking is could have been cut down. Small moments like that really could have been cut out. And it yeah, that's a great point pace because better. right when we get into the action, because we have that huge action scene with the military shooting it, and then we get a, like the first shot of the creature's face roaring down at them, which I really felt the scope of that, and then yeah. we have a hard stop. 
where right. it's time for them to sit down, process, reflect, have little heart to hearts, ask silly little questions. And I don't think that's really good for the pacing because the audience, when we get into it, let's go. Don't give yeah. us a hard stop. And I mean, the pacing wasn't really killed per se, but it really was kind of like you said, where it's like, well, okay. And then thankfully we get that great tunnel scene afterwards. But yeah, there needs to, there are some times where there's some really great action and then some hard stops, those transitional scenes where nothing's happening. Yeah. And right. I don't know. I don't really understand. That's why I think watching it in the investigation mode would be very helpful because I don't understand where, like how they're moving through the city. It would have been helpful if they would have said, we need to just keep heading north or something. And then to get out of the city, we need to head east. Give us some blatant cardinal directions. Because otherwise, I don't understand how sometimes the monster's there with them. Sometimes they're nowhere near it. Sometimes right. they get there. Sometimes we don't know where. It's very confusing where they're at. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it, the, although I do think that the tunnel scene is pretty cool because their objective is to take a ton, one of the tunnels that goes outside of the island. Um, that way they can get to mainland and not have to worry about the monster because the monster is stuck on Manhattan. But, of course, the the babies from the monster end up in the tunnel and then that bites Marlena and then they can't because they, need to, they exit the first station that they come to. Yeah, some of these moments probably should have been cut down or placed in different a different area in the timeline. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of get it once we enter the subway from the huge action, action scene when we first see the, the monster like almost in its full glory um, we kind of need a moment to process it all but that doesn't it doesn't need to be this long that's kind of my whole point is that it's mm -hmm. just it's too long and yeah. we could have cut it down significantly and moved on and have and it would have had that tunnel scene that you know just kind of kept the pace going and right. and not have that such a hard stop and be like okay we need to take a moment to slow down and build characters that doesn't need to happen until later in the movie no, and I will say the end with the helicopter scene is great. I love the scope where he's filming from the helicopter and we see the actual full body monster, the size of it. We see it just yes. getting bombed from the stealth and then it lunges at the copter. They go crashing down. And then I was so shocked when HUD looks up and he sees it right above him. That was kind of a jaw dropping moment for me. And I think this is a really nice end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think that Cloverfield does a really good job at building tension because mm -hmm. you really, when this, when these moments happen, you really feel the, um, that's what I'm thinking of. You really feel that, oh crap, this is so not good. And like that panic yeah. of the moment between the characters, like when they, when the helicopter gets hit, although I do find it a bit unbelievable that the monster just lunges at the helicopter. That was really uh, hard to I'll believe for that because moment. the monster is really small from compared yeah. to those skyscrapers and they are clearly way above it so oh, this yeah. thing has to have like insane jumping ability to get up there yeah right. it didn't make any sense yeah and so that moment when the helicopters hit and they're just the thing is just spinning and uh everyone's just like hanging on and you hear them all just yelling that's a great moment and really any moment where there is that monster in the way and their characters are panicking trying to get away I think all of those are really, really good moments. This movie has a really does a really good job at building that tension and showing that panic between all of these all these people. Um, so I think that that's one of the best things about this movie is that fact that makes it not only so engaging with this, with how it's filmed and being a found footage movie, but also the way that it, it talk the way that it um, implements and executes its tension building moments. Uh, yes, that moment when they're flying in the helicopter and you see the monster, the bomber just kind of drop all those bombs and it hits the monster and it runs against the, uh, the skyscraper and like it pulls down all those windows. Awesome moment. And mm -hmm. it's really cool because we finally get to see the monster in its full glory at this point. Like you see everything. Um, now for me though, I think one of the things that probably also could have been cut was when they do show the monster up close and then it attacks Rod or HUD. I think that we had at that point we had already seen the monster and i think that maybe it broke its rule of being su too secret um that it maybe decided to show a bit too much and that it shows the monster just standing there right in front of hud and then just eats him for one reason or another i think that 
that probably could have been cut out. Um, we've already seen the monster and it's and everything when we were up on the copter, and that's one of the brief moments we get with it. Maybe one more moment after that, whoops, would have been would have been great to have. But I think that this is a bit too much for a movie that's just shrouded in secrecy from beginning to end as to where this monster came from, why it's attacking, what's happening, and everything. You know, we're only following these characters and. Now we get this monster who attacks HUD, and that's kind of one moment that I found to be quite unbelievable for a movie that's grounded in realism almost. The reason I did like that HUD was taken out of the equation is because we got the heart to heart with Rob and Beth, which yeah. we kind of it came full circle from the beginning. And honestly, when he said I love you and she said I love you, and then just those bombs went off, those massive bombs, and I'm assuming they died. I found it to be a emotional scene and kind of hard to watch. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And I think that the that connection with Beth and Rob is very important for this movie because we get that we get some kind of drive, you know, to to try and live and make it through the situation. Mm -hmm. That I understand and maybe HUD could have been killed off earlier. I would have actually kind of liked that <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah. but yeah, I think that the, the way that he goes out could have been just done better in my own opinion. I do think, I do agree with you. The moment with Robin Beth is a good moment. Uh, one that probably needed to happen because of Rob's character arc. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. So it's technically not the end of the movie because we see the camera survives still somehow. Yes. Yes. That is an amazing camera, how it's able to handle oh, I know. <laughs> massive falls and breaks or hits or whatever. But anyways, it cuts back to them on the Ferris wheel. It's showing the ocean, and to the naked eye, it's impossible to see. I've seen it on YouTube videos where they zoom in to the ocean and do like a circle around it, and they show this tiny little thing fall into the ocean. I still don't think I understand how that's connected to the movie's but I think when we come back for 10 Cloverfield Lane, we'll be able to talk about it a little more. But I do know it's somehow connected with the Slusho Company, who has, which is a subsidiary of the Tagarato Group, I believe, which is some massive corporation, and that was their satellite. And the other thing that was very interesting is, um, so when Marlena has those bite marks, they found, they like tested like the the stuff coming from the creatures in the bite marks. It's the same stuff that has been mined from the bottom of the ocean. And is yeah. a main ingredient in the slushos drinks, actually. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know the connection. And that's one thing we're going to have to kind of be okay with with these movies is there are a lot of... They're all interconnected, and there's a lot of mystery behind them, and I think with each installment, it's just another piece of the puzzle until finally it's like, I see now. This is yeah. why it happened in 1, 2, and 3, and 4, 5, whatever. Right. But anyways, I do got to say Beth's last line, I had a good day. That was a little cheesy, I thought. Yeah. A, a little cheesy, but it does bring the whole movie in full circle because the first time the movie is, it's going to be a good day from Rob. Yeah, that's true. So we do get that closure at the very end, which I I kind of enjoyed. But yeah, you're right. Kind of cheesy. Um, now, I have a question for you. Okay. Did you see King Kong at all in this movie? No. There is a single frame what? of King Kong on top of the Empire State Building from the OG 1933 version in this movie at one point. It's one frame, and it's when the helicopter hits the ground. It The camera glitches and then there's just one frame it just it's there and it's gone you would never know it if unless you're looking for it i only knew it because i think i heard about it at one point and i knew that it was somewhere in all the glitches that happened whenever the cameras hit i found it uh it is that moment when the when the helicopter hits the ground it flashes a single frame from king kong the og when he's on top of the empire state building and you see that biplane flying by nice yes i yeah. knew uh, JJ and the producers and the creature design -er were incredibly influenced by King Kong and, mm -hmm. of course, Godzilla. So this was their attempt at – they wanted to make a kind of a modern-day King Kong-esque film. That's very yeah. interesting. I'm going to have to frame frame forward that scene. Yeah, I had to do that. I had to do a – Frame. I do frame by frame to find it. Every time there were glitches, I stopped the movie, went back, and mm. did a frame by frame just okay. to see if there's something there. This is the only one that I caught that was there, 
um, with the King Kong at the towards the end there. So yeah. Oh, cool. Very neat Easter egg in that. Yeah. Well, I did check the timestamp when the movie ended, and it ended at one hour and thirty minutes. Really? It is. It is technically on the back of the box. It'll say it's like eighty-five minutes or something like that. But no, it is only an hour and thirteen minutes. So it is an incredibly short movie. That's interesting. That's just about as long as Nightmare Before Christmas. But that one makes sense because it's Damn. claymated, yeah, and that takes a long time. So, Alan, what is your rating and recommendation for Cloverfield? Honestly, Cloverfield is just plain fun. I mean, that's really the only reason anybody ever came to this movie in the first place, aside from it just being a complete secret. This movie is just downright a lot of fun. It's an adrenaline rush from beginning to end once the monster attacks the city, um, all that kind of stuff. It's great fun to watch. And I, I, this is something that I will return to just because it is just a fun movie. Um, it is not very deep and it doesn't need to be. It is not very thought provoking, I guess. Not, I guess, not in terms of self reflection or anything. Thought provoking in terms maybe of, okay, well, what in the world is this? You know. But yes, we do get some pretty, pretty uh, great 9 11 terrorists. Uh, imagery in this movie and um that is something that i feel like fits it very very well especially at the time right after 9 11 there had of course been more terrorist attacks this works great and for the time even for now it's still kind of almost it is does make the movie all the scarier to watch and witness some of those images not actually terrorist attacks but just images of them so that's something I do have to commend the movie for putting on display is those images of 9-11 attacks and stuff like that. But there is one thing I do want to mention. There is in no way, shape, or form, uh, in no way, shape, or form is Cloverfield an original movie. And I say this because every single thing that happens in this movie, from the monster attacking the city to it being a found footage film to different points in the story, getting from A to B, we have seen a thousand times before. And that is something that could be potentially a very big drawback for a lot of people. But I disagree with that. And I say that just because it is like everything else doesn't mean it's not necessarily good. The whole thing that I mentioned this before, the whole thing about Cloverfield that really makes it great in my mind, and a lot of, as much fun as it is, is execution. Because I mentioned before that this movie has great tension building and that is one thing that carries this movie forward from scene to scene to scene for me is that the scenes where there are those moments of panic are done really, really well. Everything else in the movie is kind of okay. And like I said before, like I just said, it's not the most, it's not original in any sense because it, like, we, like we just mentioned, it's clearly taking off of King Kong and Godzilla with this giant monster attacking the city. That's unmistakable. And that's what it's going for. And there are moments, of course, like I just like I just said, that it just blatantly is homaging different movies or taking off from different movies. But just because of the execution of how the movie handles these different moments of attacks from the monster that I feel is what makes this movie as good as it is. And that, for me, is what makes it so much fun to watch. Other than that, T.J. Miller doesn't really do the greatest job here. Some of the acting is quite hammy. Um, some of the... Uh, seeing a lot of actually a lot of the scenes we are questioning why in the world is this being filmed um basic found footage questions which i wish i didn't have to ask but i would say for a found footage movie this is one of the better ones this one in chronicle are on my list of two two or three of the best kind of these kind of movies this one is more of a horror movie than chronicle is but they do vastly they do vastly show realism as much as they can, which is kind of the whole goal. But it feels as if you're really in the moment with these kind of movies. I guess I could also put um, Blair Rich Project on that list as well. So all, and all in all, it is so, so much fun. That's really what it is. It's meant to be a fun joyride, something that you just kind of sit down. and If you want to, you can explore the lore in it. It's a lot of fun. So for me, I'm giving Cloverfield a 7 out of 10. Solid recommend. It's If you haven't seen it, please go and watch it. It's I don't think you'll be disappointed. It is just a lot of fun to watch. A lot of fun, a lot of great tension building, all that kind of stuff. From a found footage movie, for me, giving this up that high of a score is pretty 
remarkable, I would say. And I also found Cloverfield to be quite the enjoyable thrill ride. It's kind of got something for everybody here. There's a bit of romance involved. There is horror involved, action, thrillers. There are monsters, and there's a bit of everything, like I said. I think one of the drawbacks that will be harder for people to really get into this movie is the handheld camera and it being almost nauseating in some sequences. But if you can watch it on a screen that doesn't really kind of throw that in your face, then I think you can enjoy this movie. And I found myself enjoying Cloverfield more than I did the first time around because it's a movie you can... I, I can't really say you can invest in the characters. I know I didn't really invest in the any any of the characters' relationships, but I could find myself in those shoes. And I think that's what they wanted is you are in the shoes. It's almost like a theme park ride in a way where you just have to buckle in and you are trying to get out of there and escape from these crazy situations. It's uh, very immersive. And I found some scenes to be quite intense, actually. I was surprised at how intense I felt certain scenes were. And so the CGI is a little bit dated, I would say, in some areas. I was like, yeah. well, that's not good. But <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> otherwise, it's not too bad, uh, comparatively, I guess you could say. But I did really enjoy myself with Cloverfield, and I was surprised at... Uh, how thrilling and adventurous and even kind of scary it was in certain ways. So I'm giving Cloverfield 8 out of 10 a solid recommend. It's a solid movie. If you can kind of overlook some of those almost, I guess, necessary flaws, which need to happen or else you're not going to have a movie, <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, they They don't really make sense, but you understand you're here to watch the movie and have a good time and enjoy yourself so that's why i say yeah go ahead and enjoy yourself with cloverfield right and i i do agree with you when you said that it's kind of like a theme park ride um it kind of feels it kind of makes you feel trapped when you watch it because uh you're you feel like you're trapped along with these characters and you're and you have to experience what they're going through and like you said it is pretty horrific at times just knowing that just having that first person perspective which is honestly what makes this movie just like i said before many times it was it was what makes this movie as engaging as it is um so yeah i also enjoyed the one piece of score at the end of this uh composed by michael giacchino um, interesting that he composed this last piece it sounds good i also found i thought this would make a pretty good video game Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be pretty fun, actually, I would think, to play running through the streets of New York, trying to fight off these creatures and trying not to die from this thing that's kind of hunting you. You have to get out of the city. You also have to save a character or two along the way. I could see this being a great video game if done right. I could also see it being a terrible video game if done wrong. If they introduced too yes. many characters and stupid objectives, which would probably happen. But anyway, I do enjoy these movies because for people that don't like to play video games, they do kind of get a very similar experience with movies like this. And I think that's really nice because I know sometimes I don't like to play certain video games, but I still want that experience. But like I said, I don't want to immerse myself in it and spend like 30 hours trying to do it. Or it'll just make me too tense where I won't even feel good. I don't like that. I didn't really feel so tense in this movie that it just drained me or messed up my, give me a headache or muscle ache or something like a video game can do. So I do enjoy it for that aspect as well. But I want to say thank you listeners for joining us on our very first Cloverfield review. And we will be back fairly soon with our review of 10 Cloverfield Lane. And I am psyched. To review that movie. Just a little teaser, a little hint. I saw that movie twice within like three days or something. I saw it and I like two or three days later, I took my family to go see it because I was just, I don't know. I really loved Tin Cloverfield Lane. So we'll see what my SSG goggles tell me when I watch it next week. And I'm, right. I got the Blu ray as a birthday present. I was really thrilled about that. And I'm going to, 
shout out to my girlfriend who got it for me. Thank you. So uh, I'm I'm excited. I'm going to definitely check out the special features. I'm hoping we get some really nice special features with that. Yeah, I am yeah. too. I'm really excited because I saw it once in theaters. I own the Blu-ray. Oh, nice. And I haven't returned to it yet since I watched it in theaters. So I'm curious to see what my thoughts are coming back to it. Nice. Well, we have The Lost World Jurassic Park up right now. We also have the Oscars discussion up. And Ready Player One will be coming very soon. Avengers Mm -hmm. Solo. We are coming out with some really big reviews very soon. Alan's working on some uh, online reviews that will be published on the website. We've got some of those written articles coming for you soon. Uh, Just a little uh, teaser. I'm working on the Ultimate James Bond Guide right now. So I'm very much looking forward to giving you a James Bond Guide to all 25, 25 or 24. I don't know. There's a lot. (laughs) We're going to find out. That's why I'm writing the guide so I can know for sure. Right. Right, and I'll go ahead and give it away. Uh, a couple of the reviews that I'm working on right now. Um, by this point, uh, if it isn't out already, it'll it be out very soon. I'm running a review on a on an anime that I just discovered this last month called Gunslinger Girl, and it is something that I've been gushing about and dying to talk about forever because, well, not forever, but was some I'm dying to talk about for somebody because it's a it's kind of a dead anime, but one that I think is so worth the discussion. So that one's coming out if it isn't already out. It's going to be quite a long article because I'm covering not only the anime, both seasons, but also the manga, and we'll have a discussion and everything. My other review that I'm working on currently is The Case for Christ. I'm almost done with it, and that I also, if it isn't out by the time this was released, it would be very close. Um, both of those I've been working on for a little bit longer than I usually do. Though Gunslinger Girl, I've actually been working on more than Case for Christ. But yes, both of those are coming uh, eventually. Um, if they aren't already out, they'll be out quite soon. Very excited for those. Also, I am currently reading Ready Player One. By the time this podcast comes out, I should be done with it, maybe? Or almost done with it. So, And I yeah. will be giving you... Uh, f- we like to do... Once in a while, honestly, I think I've only done one. I've got some others in the works right now. But we like to have a little uh, segment called From Page to Screen where we talk about the differences from the book to the movie, how well the adaption works and whatnot. So I will be doing one of those for Ready Player One, which I'm extremely excited about. And the book is very, very good so far. And I'm really hoping the they're going to be just great and we get a lot of the things from the book i'm hoping it's a close adaption it seems like it will be but we've got a bunch of great content coming your way very soon or it maybe it's already out i don't know well thank you very much listeners once again for joining us make sure to subscribe in your favorite fashion social media email anyway we do not send out the classic letters so do not try and sign up for that there's no way to do that you won't get a letter in the mail so <laughs> this is the digital age but Anyways, make sure to subscribe because you don't want to miss out on this great content that we'll be bringing you. Once again, thank you for listening and we will catch you next time.